Good morning. Welcome to the last day of DevConf. Um, first speaker of the day. <laughs> yes, yeah, sad. Um, next up is John Sullivan, who will be uh, from a Free Software Foundation comparing open source and free software to their dietary equivalents. Thanks. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, first things first, uh, since this is the last morning talk of DevConf 16, can we just take a minute and give a round of applause to the organizers and local team that put this all together? Thank you, guys. <laughs> I'm standing. I don't know what's wrong with these people. Uh, it's been a really great experience for me. Um, and I've seen a, a lot of happy faces and happy feet uh, around, so I think other people are feeling the same way. I'm definitely exhausted, but um, very happily so. And thank you also to the organizers for helping to make sure there's been ample vegan food um, to eat in the cafeteria. That's really uh, helped keep me going. So I'm going to talk today about software and food. Um, and I don't mean dog fooding, which is usually the reference that we hear. It kind of sounds gross, but about uh, whether you use the software, you or your project, right? Um, instead, I'm going to talk more about the analogies between dietary choices and software choices. And I'm interested in this because I'm interested in free software as a movement and uh, in building that movement and in seeing comparisons between that movement and other social movements, uh, especially ones that seem to be more successful in terms of numbers and uh, predate the one that we work in. And I wanted to talk about this here because I, I would really love to see more public advocacy work for free software coming out of Debian. Uh, and I think that would benefit Debian by paving the way for advocacy of the operating system um, and uh, as well as for the project stated goals and mission. And I think we have a lot of people in Debian who are really passionate and knowledgeable and really, really good at explaining the importance of free software to the people around them. And we definitely have an international community. You know, we, our agents are everywhere, uh, so to speak, as you can see anytime you come to one of these events. And I'd be happy to volunteer my help um, within Debian to those projects and then also to help uh, drive any collaborative efforts that we can come up with between the FSF and Debian as organizations. Uh, but in general, my interest in this uh, started with reading this book called The Bloodless Revolution, uh, which is a history of vegetarian activism. And uh, honestly, it's, a, it's pretty dense, uh, but I've been learning a lot of potentially interest, interesting things about a very long-term social movement. It starts with the vegetarian movement in Western culture around 1600, uh, which puts it a, probably a, a few centuries older than our movement. The FSF just support, uh, celebrated its 30th anniversary last October. So I start with this as a title, but it's a, it's a bit of a ruse because I'm not really going to talk too much about differences between free software and open source. This is more of a jumping off point. But I am curious how many people have heard this before or seen anybody say this before. Anybody? At least one. That well, wasn't for me, was it? OK. Because uh, I didn't come up with this. I know that I've seen it somewhere. But when I put this talk together, I've been unable to find an original source to credit. So uh, I didn't come up with it. but it, it gives us a, a place to start talking about the different motivations people have for participating in both uh, free software and open source. I think that why this analogy sounds kind of clever is because we think of free software as going further than open source, and we think of veganism as going further than vegetarianism. Uh, one thing I can tell you before uh, we get going here is that the FSF's mission is not to promote vegetarianism or veganism. Uh, <laughs> I know that disappoints some of us. I've been vegan myself for about 18 years, um, and three out of the FSF's 13 staff are currently vegan. And as executive director, I do get to do the hiring. Uh, <laughs> but I promise that's not on the required qualification list. Uh, over the years, the number has fluctuated quite a bit. You know, There have been times over the 13 years I've been at the FSF that I've been the only vegan um, on the staff. But uh, this is something I said recently. The FSF takes no position on either Trump or veganism, other than to say both Trump and vegans should use free software. <laughs> uh, this is overstating things a bit, I realized after saying it, because uh, we do hold some positions that disagree with some positions that Trump holds. Uh, for example, we like the freedom to use software for encrypting communications. 
uh, became evident during the uh, kerfuffle with Apple and the FBI that Trump does not support using uh, encryption for communications. Um, but my point here is that at the FSF, I try really hard for us to minimize the scope for disagreement. You know, we should hold only the positions that are truly necessary for, to hold uh, free software ideals and to achieve our mission. Because uh, it's a reality that free software has supporters from all across the political spectrum, you know, from libertarians to communists. Uh, and that's probably how it should be, because we see free software as an essential, uh, essential building block of a modern free society. Because if we don't have that, then otherwise our political speech, our ability to associate with each other is filtered, uh, monitored, controlled by the people who own the technology. So even if you're on the Trump campaign trying to push your uh, agenda, you really should be using free software because if you're not, you're not in control um, of how that agenda is distributed to people or of your own communication. Um, but if we're going to build an effective movement, we, we need to not fracture this unity that we have across uh, different political positions on other topics. We need to make it as easy as possible for anyone to join the free software movement without challenging any more of their other principles and beliefs uh, than is absolutely necessary. And that's hard to remember. Um, there's a lot of things that, as an organization, we want to use our, you know, the, what visibility we have to speak out against uh, things that concern us as individuals within the organization. But I think it's, it's really important and really important advocacy principle in general whenever you're trying to uh, introduce somebody to a, a new idea. So we don't advocate veganism. Um, but I do have to point out that free software really loves animals. You only have to look at the logos of lots and lots of free software projects to realize this. Uh, this is a logo made, a, a drawing made by uh, Matt Lee several years ago at the FSF. And almost everything in there is an animal or at least meant to look like an animal. So uh, food is, a, I think, a good analogy for computer literacy in general. Uh, and RMS, in an article that he wrote many years ago, Why Software Should Be Free, uh, talks about this. The way that we take our freedom to uh, modify food, to prepare our own food for granted, and how absurd it is to think that a, a chef who came up with a recipe could tell us, uh, no, you're not allowed to put salt on your food. Uh, only I'm allowed to do that on this food. And I'll do it for you if you pay me, but not till I get around to it. You know, that's kind of the way proprietary software treats us. We don't accept that treatment um, from food. And I'm finding with the FSF that uh, a lot of our campaigns and advocacy efforts are really running into a problem, which is a just lack of basic computer uh, literacy and knowledge uh, in the pop in general population. And this isn't because people are incapable or even because they're making poor choices. It's just uh, we've lost ground in this area, and that means you know, think about the, the basic level of knowledge we all have about food because we all have to eat every day uh, in order to be healthy. You know, we know that food is prepared by multiple people in a restaurant if you go out to eat, that it's prepared from a recipe, that it usually involves taking different ingredients and combining them, often with heat, that if uh, somebody makes a mistake and handles some ingredients improperly, it can make you sick. Uh, and you know that if you like a dish at a restaurant, you can get a, you know, get a recipe, uh, and make something comparable at home. You can make changes to it. We know that food can be served on many different plates, okay, uh, and still taste the same and have the same nutritional value. And we take all these things for granted. But think about the equivalence for software. You know, how many people actually know that software is constructed by people working together in a language that is human readable and then transformed into something else? And then if you had access to that human readable recipe, you could make changes to it yourself or you could uh, go and, and have the same thing from a different place, that you can have the same uh, software running on devices that look very differently. And this is important because, you know, how many people will actually know that if you wanted to, you could run Android on an iPhone, right, in the, in the general population? People think that if you want to switch from Android to iPhone, you have to go out and buy a new iPhone. You have to buy a new phone um, or vice versa. So. This is becoming a real obstacle for us. We can't convince people about the importance of source code or the importance of a culture of computers that shares source code among the people who work on it unless people understand what that is. So I think we need to start looking for what the most basic elements of R that we are required in order to explain free software and, and do a better job 
um, promoting that kind of education and actually possibly doing some of it. So I want to walk through this analogy between uh, free software and, and vegetarian and, and veganism specifically as a subset of that food idea, see how the tofurkey is made. So when we're learning from other movements, we can look at things like how they explain their message, uh, what imagery they use, what reasons people have for participating in the movement, uh, what the movement uh, proponents do to get the word out, and uh, learn from that. We need to start with our definitions. I'm going to go through these quickly because I think we all, for the most part, know here free software. Ability to run the program, share it, study it, modify it. Veganism. Uh, practice of abstaining from the use of animal products, particularly in diet. And I thought this definition is interesting because it also refers to the philosophy that rejects the commodity status of animals, um, besides just the dietary practice. The open source definition is uh, longer and uh, more specific in some ways than the free software uh, definition, but it ends up pointing really to the same body of software and practice. This is a point I want to emphasize because I here are strange things sometimes, like people think that only copyleft software is free software and permissively licensed software is open source software, and that's not true. Uh, when it comes down to it, pretty much the same software licenses, uh, for all intents and purposes, the same software licenses pass the free software definition and the open source definition. So when we're talking about uh, what these terms mean and possible differences between them, the differences don't come from uh, the actual software itself or their licenses. But uh, and vegetarianism uh, is a superset of uh, veganism. So some vegetarians may abstain from some animal byproducts, but generally we call uh, vegetarians who abstain from all animal product, byproducts vegan. So it's not just that you don't eat meat, you also don't eat eggs uh, or drink milk or cheese, things that are made from animals. We do have a vegan software license, as I discovered while I was preparing this talk. Uh, so you agree that you are not developing or manufacturing products and where applicable their ingredients, which involve testing of any sort on animals. You agree that you're not participating in the animal testing industry, that you're not producing products that have animal byproducts, you're not doing GMOs. Uh, this is a non-free license. Yeah. <laughs> this is uh, also not an open source license. It's been enforced? Oh, oh. <laughs> no, I, I haven't. Um, it's called the uh, EXTJS license. So, uh, so that's the next step is to figure out what it, it's used. I believe the program that it was written for is called XTJS. But yeah, it, I didn't know that existed until I started looking into this uh, analogy. Uh, but this is not free or open source because it and doesn't pass the Debian free software guidelines either because it restricts uh, what you can use the software for. You can't use it to hurt animals. Well, I would hope you wouldn't use software to hurt animals, but putting a restriction on that through the copyright license uh, would make it non-free. Uh, it's in Debian. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, okay, well, hopefully it's a uh, dual license. <laughs> uh, maybe it also changed licenses. Um, I just found this uh, example as publication of the license itself. Maybe it's not in use. If it is, please file a bug. <laughs> Okay, good. It's under JPL v3, which is a free software license. Uh, so I want to go through the reasons why people choose to be a vegetarian or, or a vegan. And I'm going to present these reasons in the best light, um, but you know, don't understand me as uh, advocating all of them or the FSF is advocating them. Um, I think that each of these reasons uh, leads people to different kinds of solutions. And I'm going to go through just a list and then uh, talk about some of them uh, more in depth. So people don't eat meat because they think it's better for the environment, um, because raising cattle, for example, takes water and uh, plants because you have to feed the cattle. So you can save resources by eating those things, eating and drinking those uh, resources directly instead of uh, eating the animal afterward. Uh, taste. Um, there are, I know people who choose to be vegetarian just because they think meat is gross. Um, they're not particularly concerned about the ethical aspect or the environment. They just don't like it. Uh, health. Uh, people think that uh, meat can cause cancer or heart disease, things like that. So they uh, view a vegetarian diet as being healthier. Religion. We have Buddhist vegetarians and a long history of vegetarianism in India based on religious principles and uh, cultural backgrounds. 
meat industry excesses, um, which is not a great label, but it's the best thing I could come up with to talk about the category of vegetarianism, which is uh, not that it's necessarily wrong to eat meat, but that the way that meat is raised and uh, the animals are treated specifically is wrong. And so, you know, they would maybe opt for free range chicken or cruelty free meats, but would not eat uh, meat at McDonald's, for example. The freegan, uh, which is somebody who will only buy uh, things that are vegetarian and not animal products, but will happily eat something that's meat or an animal product that's given to them if it wasn't bought solely for them. So, for example, something that was about to go to waste or a group dinner where food was bought for everybody and not specifically for them. And then ethics, so the belief that it's wrong to kill animals or it's wrong to keep animals confined uh, is a, a rather popular reason. So we talked about the environmental aspect um, and how this relates to software. So I think that it does. Uh, I think that even if you're not a programmer, you may support free software because you benefit from the kind of software that's produced in a world where software is distributed under terms that respect the freedom of the users who do modify it and the developers. So you can think of this as similar to the free press, where even though you don't run a magazine or a newspaper, you benefit from other people who do run those things having the freedom to uh, speak their mind and share information without censorship. If you don't have a free press, then you get bad information even if you're not the one uh, putting that information out there originally. Uh, so I think this is a, a reason that we don't make enough use of, really, because it's one that appeals to everybody regardless of whether, potentially appeals to everybody regardless of whether they directly develop software or not. One of the things we run into often is, why should I care about the freedom to modify the source code if I'm never actually going to modify the program? Well, because you have a better software environment, a better software culture, um, because any problems, it makes it harder for people to mistreat users if things like backdoors, surveillance mechanisms can be removed and the improved version with those things removed can be shared with everybody regardless of whether that person, whether any of those users had the ability to make that change directly themselves. I do have to also point out that we have seen direct impacts of proprietary software on the environment, the way that Volkswagen, for example, uh, and now others have been busted using software that uh, lied on emissions tests, which has potential implications on the environment. So maybe we can actually say that proprietary software hurts the environment too. Uh, but I have to say, don't call it an ecosystem. Um, this is one of the points that RMS makes about language and framing, uh, that people like to talk about the ecosystem of software and free software and open source, and ecosystems are things that uh, sort of are systems that operate amongst themselves, and that kind of understates our ability to influence our surroundings by adopting ethical stances, making different decisions. So uh, it's a reason, even if you don't worry as much about the specific term, keep that concept in mind that we're talking about a culture, but it's a culture of individuals who have agency that can take actions and change things, not just a system that operates according to uh, rules. <laughs> Taste. So I think this is a very popular reason for promoting free software. That people who want to emphasize mainly that free software is better. It works better. Uh, it runs on more hardware. And Often people who subscribe primarily to this reason want us to focus less on criticizing proprietary software and the ways it can mistreat users and want us to focus more on making sure that the free software is better and uh, can, you know, gives a clear reason why a new user should start uh, using it. You know, programs like Firefox went a long way by being not only free software but by being actually better than the browsers that they were competing with at the time and, and uh, most features that users cared about. Um, so it leads you down the path of criticizing less and also down the path of investing more of uh, resources in developing programs and improving the programs. So as a, a beacon, this has been one of the main ways that I've been an advocate, you know, rather than uh, overtly talking to people much about the reasons, I have focused more on learning to cook vegan food that tastes good. Um, it doesn't all have to taste like stale quinoa. And at the FSF, we certainly brag about when free software is better and want to use that as an entry point. Uh, but we also think it's important that people avoid proprietary software even when it's better at some things. And if you know uh, Mako Hill, who's on the FSF board and also a longtime Debian developer, has a great talk about this you can find called uh, When Free Software Isn't Better. 
And I think it makes some important points here. But nonetheless, we have to acknowledge this as an important and popular reason why people do get interested in free software. And it's not just the actual uh, you know, advocating vegetarianism and software. It's not just the uh, actual taste. It's kind of the structure and the assumptions um, that frame our understanding of these things. So uh, one thing I hear a, a lot uh, when people are asking me about uh, veganism is, you know, why do you have all these meat replacement products? Why do you have tofu hot dogs and uh, chicken nuggets? Uh, partly, you know, I think they really are for people who miss meat, um, but I think they also come from a need to replicate the, the meal structures that we have. So you have a protein and a vegetable and a starch, and that's what a lot of people you know, around the world have grown up with. So we face this as an obstacle in free software because when people think or argue that proprietary software is better, in some cases, there's no objective measurement of that. It's not objectively better, uh, but it is in more in line with people's experiences, what they learned how to use, and what they're comfortable with. So you know, the, the Windows desktop is not better than the GNOME desktop. It's just that people have more familiarity growing up with learning in school what the Windows desktop looks like, you know, what that meal looks like. So if you, if you care a lot about uh, meeting people you know, at the location of those expectations and, and trying to make the software just work better for them, then it leads you to things like uh, the GIMP, you know, the project that made GIMP look just like Photoshop. Right? So GIMP has, uh, I know professional artists using GIMP. Uh, GIMP works as well as Photoshop if you spend uh, time learning it. Um, but the interface was very different. And so there was a project that just took the GIMP code and put the Photoshop interface on top of it. And that's the kind of you know, advocacy approach that this uh, reason leads you towards. I think this can be taken to extremes. I learned recently that there is a veggie burger that bleeds when you <laughs> cut into it. Uh, this is a new thing made with beet juice to give that nice red color. Uh, it also sizzles when you cook it. So i done some engineering work to try to make this very similar to the feeling of cooking a hamburger. Any guesses who is behind this? Could you be a large food chain? No, no, but sort of. Oh. Our friend, <laughs> Bill Gates. <laughs> uh, the company is called, I believe, Beyond Meat, um, and it's backed by many people, including Bill Gates. Um, and this kind of, you know, it, it's funny to me because, and, and us because we support free software um, and he doesn't. But it goes back to that original point that, you know, our principles uh, need to be focused on free software. I might be kind of happy about Bill Gates doing this uh, if it helps promote vegetarianism as a vegetarian, but I am, you know, not happy about any of the things he's done with uh, as it relates to free software and the GPL. So we have to stay focused on what we're actually trying to accomplish. Um, I was trying to think of analogies between like what is the equivalent of making a veggie burger bleed um, in free software. Uh, I, things I came up with were, you know, there's occasional efforts to implement some kind of DRM in free software, which never made any sense to me because the user can modify it. It can't really restrict them. Um, there's projects like Ganache and Moonlight that uh, served originally mainly to make code designed for proprietary systems. Uh, plugins, proprietary plugins run on free operating systems. You know, maybe some of the pressure we experience to make our desktop look like the Mac. Uh, maybe, maybe the best example is things like Wine and LibreOffice having to establish bug for bug compatibility with Microsoft. Uh, those are sort of like making your veggie burger bleed. Uh, health. Uh, I think of the analogy here for free software as being. Um, Free software being uh, better in specific areas that are go beyond just like working well, you know, which is more into the taste category. But in this, we're talking about things that are in the security and uh, privacy genre. Uh, and this is a bit different also from the taste reason because it, with this reason, we still do uh, focus on criticizing the shortcomings of proprietary software, pointing out how it can be bad for you is a key component of making the argument for health about how free software can be good for you. And this is a reason that the FSF does spend some time uh, focusing on. We have, for example, our email self-defense guide at emailselfdefense.fsf.org is aimed at helping people get started using GPG for encryption for their email. Uh, and we do, in other places, we have an ongoing campaign against uh, bulk surveillance, which emphasizes that free software is 
really important for protecting your privacy uh, and personal security. But similar to you know, what vegetarian advocates say about diet and health, um, free software can't guarantee your health. Right? It can't guarantee your privacy and security. We know lots of examples of security problems in free software, uh, but it's the best baseline to start from. You know, people advocating vegetarianism, just because you eat vegetables isn't going to make you healthy. You also have to do things like exercise or you know, climb lots of steps every day. Uh, so I think they're very similar in that way. And it's kind of like the environment reason, we can see examples of how proprietary software directly impacts people's health. You know, uh, Karen Sandler's talk earlier this week about uh, proprietary software running on uh, her medical uh, heart device and on lots of other people's devices and the uh, inappropriate things that that software has done uh, show that proprietary software actually does directly impact people's health too, in addition to being an analogy. Religion, that's all I'm going to say about this one. Uh, I, you can guess where I stand on this question, I think. So. Uh, well, actually, it's not, there are uh, GNU Linux distributions, I think people uh, might have seen that are uh, produced by religious. Can we get a quick poll for Who's winning Emacs? <laughs> Vim. I see a lot of people who put both hands up, so. I, yeah. Real editors? <laughs> you mean Emma Torino? We didn't ask about Ed, but you know. Uh, but there are GNU Linux distributions that are, uh, are put out by groups with religious missions, um, too. I know there's uh, uh, all the way from uh, Christianity to Satanism. I've seen examples of uh, groups publishing distributions because that gives them the freedom to uh, present their mission in the context of an operating system. So it's, a, it's pretty cool in that way. They can't control what Windows looks like, um, but they can put some of their religious materials into uh, a Debian derivative distribution, for example, and, and share that with people. So I guess uh, religion can be a reason for participating in free software as well. The industry excesses reason, um, I think of this, I think this is pretty common, maybe more common than you would think, uh, that people who care about free software but uh, are quite willing to use some proprietary software as long as they view it as uh, insignificant. So the, the problem with, the main problem with proprietary software from this perspective is that it mistreats people, that mistreatment can be uh, solved either through regulation or through uh, actually freeing the source code and distributing it as free software. Uh, saw some of this maybe in the Apple versus FBI stuff because I saw some disturbing comments from people saying uh, that this made them happy because now they didn't have to worry as much about switching away from their iPhone to a more free software friendly platform because Apple as a company was taking a positive stance um, protecting the security and encryption of people using iPhones. And that's, uh, right. yeah, <laughs> today, right? tomorrow, who knows. Um, but not a reason that we agree with at the FSF, uh, but a reason that's out there and we want to you know, include people that come at it from this angle in the coalitions that we try to build. Freegan, also I think pretty common in free software that uh, don't buy free, don't buy proprietary software, don't contribute directly to it. Uh, but if it is in front of you and you can use it, it's, it wasn't bought for you. We have the category of people who illegally copy um, proprietary software uh, and use some free software. And you know those viewpoints can be consistent uh, if you have a general distaste for copyright law in general, um, but. It's, uh, it's also consistent with avoiding paying money to support proprietary software development. I think um, this is a bit tricky. We want people to, you know, the FSF isn't advocating ignoring copyright licenses until we can have uh, much broader reform in that area because we rely on the power of copyleft um, to protect us not only from copyright restrictions, but also to protect users from patents, uh, EULAs, things like that. So just Doing away with copyright law is not uh, a tactic that's going to work for free software until we get broader reform in those other areas that are used to restrict users. Uh, ethics, I think I'm gonna go through a few aspects of this, but there are, are many ethical arguments for free software. I'm not gonna try to cover all of them. Uh, this is one of the most compelling ones 
to me, it was from an article by Evan Mogelin in 2003 called Free Software and the Death of Proprietary Culture. Um, the important part being that if you could feed everyone on Earth at the cost of baking one loaf and pressing a button, what would be the moral case for charging more for bread than some people could afford to pay? Uh, and this speaks to the food analogy um, and the fact that we can infinitely copy software at uh, zero marginal cost. What is the moral case for denying that right to copy and share in order to help the people around you? Um, and, and of course, we're talking here not about not charging money for some service related to the software or even for the act of giving it to somebody that's allowed uh, because they can go try to find that from somebody else for less or for no cost. But the free software argument of why is, should there be a legal moral restriction prohibiting that act in the first place? Uh, there's also the political statement aspect of this, the support for when you use free software, you're making a political statement um, against the restrictions that are imposed by companies like Microsoft. And that's kind of the social signaling ethical aspect that, uh, that makes it matter about what software we use personally. Even though if we're using something personally, that's not the same thing as giving a piece of software to somebody under terms that attempt to restrict that person. Um, but at the same time, if we use software um, that has those restrictions ourselves, then we kind of send that signal, that ethical statement um, that using that kind of software and therefore distributing that soft kind of software is okay. And you know, this I think led to this is you know the roots of the difference between the original difference between open source and free software. So just a quote from RMS in his article about this that going over the history that uh, open source was some coined as a way to advocate for free software without raising the ethical reasons in order to get greater appeal uh, in the business world. Um, nowadays, things I think are a lot more complicated. So the open source initiatives uh, front page talks about software freedom uh, in those terms. You know, now people say the word open source, term open source, but they mean the same thing as free software. Uh, but we also still have people who are saying open source in order to not talk about ideals and in order to uh, signal that they are fine with a world that has both free software and proprietary software in it. So it's not really as uh, simple as what it in was intended to be originally, but it's still very complicated. And so at the FSF, we still ask people to say free software to, in order to make it clear that they care about the ethical issues. Uh, and not just the practical aspects of software or its distribution mechanisms. And if it's not the ethical issues, I think that free software is still the best uh, term for some of the other reasons that were mentioned uh, earlier as well. But if you're going to try to act uh, on these things for ethical reasons, um, you run into a lot of challenges and uh, it's hard to know where to draw the line sometimes. Same thing with vegetarianism. Uh, agriculture kills insects and animals. Uh, walking kills insects, which are animals. Um, so thinking about some similar challenges that we face in free software, uh, I was thinking about things like proprietary JavaScript, you know, that uh, you are just trying to use a completely free operating system and a free browser and interact on the network, and you are still being served bits of proprietary software without you even knowing it. Um, they're being run locally on your computer which does not inform you that this is happening. So this reminds me of the act of kind of walking around and uh, accidentally stepping on and killing things when you're really trying hard not to. Uh, or you might think of interacting with proprietary software when it's not exactly on your own computer, but uh, you know, using an ATM machine, uh, checking out at a grocery store, you know, these places where it's in the environment, you're still interacting with it, even though you're trying very hard to not support it from an ethical standpoint. So we know the mission of the FSF and the GNU project, um, because we subscribe to the ethical reasons for free software is to uh, achieve a perfect world where there is no such thing as proprietary software, that all users should be able to do everything they want to do on any computer of any size um, using only free software. But we want to work with uh, people who want free software for other reasons too. And so I think part of the challenge here and part of why I find this interesting at all is because uh, what initiatives can we design that appeal to the greatest number of those reasons that we went over? You know, what, we need numbers in order to accomplish a successful movement. What can we do to bring uh, everybody together? And for us, uh, we want to do that so we have an opportunity to talk more about the ethical reasons for free software, but also because the larger the movement, 
the more uh, conducive the social environment is to free software, the easier it is to be a free software advocate, uh, which is, so what kinds of initiatives work towards all of the reasons that, that we've talked about? Well, I think labeling is one really important initiative that helps towards uh, achieving a, a bigger and more effective movement, no matter what reasons or background you're coming from. So this logo is from the Leaping Bunny program uh, by the Coalition for Consumer Information on Cosmetics. And uh, this is a way that you can uh, look at a product and know that it was not tested on animals, which is something that's important to uh, a lot of vegans. And the point here is that if people want to make individual choices for any of the reasons that we talked about, uh, they need to know the information that's necessary to make that choice, right? And so what this logo does is uh, comes from a trusted place uh, and signals that something is uh, good for people with these beliefs to purchase, and it doesn't require them to do a bunch of uh, research in order to know what to buy. Um, there's different kinds of labeling for food, uh, and there's similar challenges here because if you're talking about, uh, let's say you go to a restaurant and the menu says clearly vegan or vegetarian, that really helps. It means you don't have to ask a bunch of questions or know a lot about how the food's prepared. But think about what we expect of users when we're promoting free software. Like, you should use a free program. Well, how do I know what, what a program, how, if a program is free or not? You have to look at the license. Well, where is the license? Well, it's in the source code. Or, or it might pop up when you start the program. Uh, and don't, confusing, well, don't confuse it with all those other programs that say they're free software, but they're not actually free software. Uh, and this is true, by the way, for open source too. Plenty of programs advertising themselves as open source, which aren't open source. So we have to find a way to get the information to users so that once they're inspired to care, they have the ability to actually act on that and the knowledge to act on that. So what kinds of labels could we have in free software? Well, this is one example. This product may contain material licensed to you under the GNU General Public License or other open source software licenses. Um, this is from the box containing a Linksys router. Uh, and this reminds me, I don't know about you, but looks to me like a warning label. Uh, and it's nice that they added the label about the GPL um, after we sued them. Uh, but it's not really what we're going for here, right? We want a label that encourages free software, not one that presents it as a warning about something that a product may contain. So the FSF has this uh, respects your freedom uh, label, certification mark, which you can read the criteria of at fsf.org slash ryf. And it's aiming for this goal of making it easy once someone is inspired to care about free software to support businesses and buy uh, devices, products that uh, respect their freedom. Uh, and for whatever reason they care, whether they think that free software will be better, more secure, ethical thing to do, better for the culture, um, this gives them a signal that this is a good product um, to support and one that will work for them. So we've certified routers, laptops, 3D printers, the ALIF objects uh, table uh, out front has, you know, promotes their um, certification from the FSF, which is awesome. Uh, we've certified uh, many products from them. And this laptop running LibreVoot uh, was something that was certified. It means it runs all free software and only requires free software. Is that the uh, Business and Bell? It is. Uh, it is a bit of a US-centric um, mark, uh, which we could improve on, I think. But we do have the words uh, available in some other languages, and we could look for more symbols that would be universal. It's not quite as easy as the bunny, though. Like, you know, everybody knows the bunny. You don't want to hurt the bunny. Um, but what's the equivalent uh, kind of international mark for freedom? Um, we would love to improve on that. <laughs> what was that? The guillotine? <laughs> Uh, and one really exciting thing, so uh, for a long time, for all the products that we had certified, this label was really only appearing on the, the website for purchasing the product, or sometimes on materials that were included inside the box on paper. But recently, we certified this uh, router from Think Penguin. It's a mini VPN uh, Wi-Fi router, and they actually put the mark uh, on the product right next to the you know, FCC and other certifications. So, I think that's really awesome to see and really exciting for the growth of the program. And then other than uh, this labeling and these kinds of initiatives, uh, I wanted to highlight you know, what I started with, which is the importance of computer literacy and education. Uh, 
get someone to program, you frustrate them for a day, teach them how to program, you frustrate them for a lifetime. Uh, but, you know, we, I think it's something uh, both in the world of the FSF and in the world of, of Debian, we have an interest in just doing what we can in our communities to promote um, basic computer literacy. Uh, I know, that, is Luke here? No. Um, so uh, Luke was, uh, yeah, well, you are here. Thanks. So you're, you're talking about teaching in, in San Francisco public schools. And I think that's awesome. And that's the kind of thing that we need uh, more happening of. But you can do this on a volunteer basis in a lot of places. Or at the FSF, we're talking about uh, how we might want to organize um, some of these efforts to uh, teach people the basics of computers. And then, of course, during that course, uh, bring up you know, the importance of having access to the source code as an educational resource. Uh, and that way, people leave with both a little bit of information about how computers work and a little bit of information about the ideologies that are involved with um, producing software. So uh, at the FSF, and for me personally, the ethical reasons to use and distribute free software are the most important. Uh, but in the meantime, we, we need to be the biggest movement that we can be, and we need to look for the biggest wins across all of these different reasons that people have for participating in the movement. Uh, and we have a movement that is centered on behavior, you know, the choices that we make to use or not use different kinds of programs and the terms under which we distribute programs that we may write ourselves. Uh, and we should look for actions that mobilize uh, communities and build bridges across all the reasons people have for doing, you know, they, have, they take the same action, they have the same behavior, but their reasons for doing so are different. So I think the analogy itself at the beginning, you know, sounds fun, um, but it doesn't really hold up. It leads us to some interesting places to think about. Um, and there's a lot more to do to look at the relative success of the vegetarian movement compared to us and how we might copy some of it. Um, but you know, people have a lot of reasons for participating in both free software and open source. Uh, and we want to appeal to as many of those people as we can, even when we think our own reason is the best reason. So I encourage people to say free software in order to flag that their interest is in this as a movement. Um, but I also encourage people to look for ways to uh, build bridges across the different reasons and different terms that people use. Um, so thank you. Some time for questions and conversation. Hi. Um, I try to distance myself from FSF purely because of RMS behavior. Mm -hmm. And that's the only behavior that I ever saw from that person because I'm relatively new to this open source and free software. What is the plan for succession of FFS, uh, FSF post RMS? Okay, so two things in there. One is that uh, no one person is going to be the right person to appeal to everybody. Um, RMS continues to build uh, on his speaking engagements around the world to bring new people into free software. Uh, but certainly the way that he approaches it, we can see it doesn't work for everyone. So. But keep in mind that it is working for a lot of people, um, and it is still helping to build uh, the movement, especially, you know, he, he had a speech in Mexico where he had 7,000 people turn up. Right? And the organizers told me they were going to have 7,000 people, and I said, no way. We'll send you 500 t-shirts. That'll be plenty. Uh, but I was wrong. Uh, so, but yes, we need many more voices. We need a lot of voices. Uh, and so at the FSF, we, you know, we have a board of directors that has uh, many free software luminaries on it, and we have, I think we're pretty well positioned to continue the vision that RMS started going forward if he decides to retire. Uh, but even in the meantime, you know, we're trying to grow as an organization. We've expanded by 50% in the last five years. Now <laughs> it's only five people uh, because that's growth from eight to 13 on staff. Uh, but it's been sustainable, and I think we have a lot more growing to do, and that will add uh, more voices out there, more people that uh, people can connect to. But of course, we're a community. We have a small staff and a large, huge base of volunteers and supporters, and a lot of the important activism doesn't come from us at all. It comes from figuring out how we as an organization can raise the profile of people in their local communities doing advocacy work uh, to people they know. That's you know, one of the things that we need to be a lot better at, I think. Cool. Thank you, John Sullivan. Thanks.